A child starts locomotion by crawling, but on this account, do we discourage walking? The recruit flinches and blinks on first firing a gun, but he is certainly not encouraged to continue this practice. Why then should the ignorant swinging of a sword be indicative of its proper use? It is in the charge that the sword is particularly needful and, in fact, finds almost its whole application. And it is here that the point is a particular advantage in stimulating to the highest degree the desire of closing with the enemy and running him through. In 1914, Major General Leonard Wood approves the publication and implementation of a manual of saber exercises to be used in conjunction with the cavalry's latest standard sword, the Model 1913 Cavalry Saber, commonly called the Patton Sword, after the man who spurs its invention, Second Lieutenant George S. Patton. Patton devised the exercises and tips in his manual from experience. In the 1912 Olympic Games, Patton is chosen as the Army's entry into the first ever pentathlon, where Patton goes on to place 21st on the pistol range. But many reports say that Patton should have been placed much higher, as Patton used a 38 caliber pistol for his target shooting. Many were convinced that the holes in the target were so large and Patton's aim so good that many rounds passed through the same hole twice. The judges disagreed, and they hold their ruling that Patton's subsequent shots missed the target entirely. Patton is a gentleman on the field of sports as well as on the field of battle. While he remains humble about the shooting competition, the accomplished athlete goes on to place seventh in swimming, sixth in the equestrian competition, third in the foot race, and fourth in fencing. After the Olympics, Patton studies fencing at the Cavalry School in Samour, France. A French master swordsman and instructor at the school, Adjutant Charles Clary, taught Patton well, and he not only returned to America with newly designed rules of engagement with combat sabers, but also with ideas for a newly designed weapon. During the punitive expedition to Mexico, Patton serves as a personal aide to John J. Pershing and eventually is given command of Troop C of 13th Cavalry in the continuing effort to capture Pancho Villa and his fighters. On May 14, 1916, Patton leads a small force of about 12 men on a foraging mission in three Dodge touring cars. The convoy surprises and kills three of Pancho Villa's men. It was not only the beginning of Patton's fascination with and implementation of motorized vehicles in combat, but it was the surprise attack that was the first motorized battle in U.S. military history. Three thousand miles from home, an American army is fighting for you. Everything you hold worthwhile is at stake. Only the hardest blows can win against the enemy we are fighting. Invoking the spirit of our forefathers, the Army asks your unflinching support to the end that the high ideals for which America stands may endure upon the earth. In 1917, the United States enters what is then called the Great War a conflict that had been raging in Europe for nearly three years. Initially, no cavalry units are deployed, but the newly formed 15th Cavalry Division at Fort Sam Houston still winds up supporting the American military in Europe. The units comprising the 15th Cavalry are subsequently trained not in cavalry tactics, but in field artillery support. The newly dubbed 7th Field Artillery supported the regular U.S. Army as a part of the 1st Expeditionary Division, which is later designated as simply the 1st Division, part of the Allied Expeditionary Force in World War I. 
while the cavalry for the most part operates only in the United States during the First World War, a few storied leaders of the cavalry are now presented with the opportunity to lead soldiers overseas. Joining the American Expeditionary Forces once again as aide to General Black Jack Pershing is Captain George Patton. In May of 1917, Patton begins his campaign in Europe by overseeing the training of American troops in Paris before being stationed at Chaumont to act as an adjutant, overseeing the operations of the base. Patton finds the post dissatisfying. While stationed at Chaumont, Patton begins to take an interest in a new form of motorized artillery, tanks. Pershing intended to place Patton in charge of an infantry battalion, but while in the hospital for jaundice, Patton meets Colonel Fox Connor, who convinces Patton to pursue his interest in tanks by establishing the American Expeditionary Forces Light Tank Corps and attending the French Army's tank training school. Patton gains more experience than any other soldier by driving a Renault FT light tank and studying the results of one of the first large-scale battles to use tanks, the British-led offensive at Cambrai, France. Soon after Patton established his tank corps, he is promoted to general and receives the first 10 tanks as they are delivered to the tank school in Langres, France in March of 1918. Because Patton was the only soldier with experience driving tanks, the general himself personally drove seven of the tanks off of the train on which they had arrived. At Langres, Patton is in charge of not only training infantrymen to become tank crews, but promoting the use of tanks themselves. At first, the infantry is reluctant to adopt the tank for warfare. But by the end of the Great War, however, the United States Army is more than convinced. Patton goes on to lead tank brigades into battle at Sam Hill, the first battle that sees American tank units, and also into Essay and Pan. At some of the battles, Patton is so confident in the tank's power that the now lieutenant colonel either led the tanks on foot into the fields of battle or rode exposed on the tops of the machines. His orders are that no tank is to ever be surrendered. Supporting the U.S. First Corps in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in late September 1918, Patton is wounded in an attack on German machine guns stationed near Chappi and continues to command his troops from a hole left in the battlefield by tank shells until he's evacuated. Patton, however, refuses admittance to the hospital before he can give his briefing to a rear command post. For his actions at Chappi, Patton is promoted to colonel and given the Distinguished Service Medal, and later a Purple Heart after that medal was instated in 1932. The wound sidelines Patton for the rest of the Great War, but the tanks roll on. As World War I reaches armistice, the United States and other allies continue to develop their tank technology and construction with the U.S. building and experimenting with light and medium-sized tanks. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.